Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this panel this morning. I want to give, my name is Amy Garmer. I am the director of journalism, pro, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, last, uh, last title, director of the Dialogue on Public Libraries at the Aspen Institute, which uh, is a, an educational and policy studies organization in, uh, in Washington, DC. The Dialogue on Public Libraries is a project that's housed within the Institute's communications and society programs. So we've been looking at public libraries through the lens of uh, the evolution of digital technologies. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by three individuals who are leading thinkers and doers in the library space. Um, and to me, that's really the definition of leadership. They bring vision and action uh, to creating change in public libraries. Uh, and they are also participants in our conference on uh, public libraries use of scenic in California. Uh, the conference was called Beyond Connectivity, Gigabit Network Use in California Pu Public Libraries. And it took place at the State Library in Sacramento back in December. And I just want to uh, acknowledge and, and recognize that uh, in addition to our panelists here, we have quite a few uh, of our participants who are here attending uh, scenic. So also here in the crowd, um, we had uh, Sonny McPeak, uh, who was one of our participants, Don Means, uh, Heather Mills from CTC uh, Technology, Kim Lewis uh, with, uh, with Scenic, uh, and then among our, our libraries uh, represented in that meeting, James Oxner from Sutter County, Susie Dave Lee from Stockton, uh, Susan Broman from LA Public Library, and Patty Wong uh, from Santa Monica. So there's, uh, there's knowledge out here in the crowd uh, about the insights from the conference that we're gonna share with you today. Our session today will include a brief presentation uh, on the conference and the insights drawn uh, from both the conference white paper and the conference report, which will be released later this spring. Uh, both the white paper and report were uh, prepared by John Horrigan. Then we'll have a discussion among the panelists about the, the insights and their implications for advancing library uptake and innovation with Scenic. And then open up the conversation to, to more comments and conversation with you all. Uh, I'd like to thank Lewis Fox for inviting us to share insights from our recent work here uh, and his colleagues Leanne and Melissa and Christine for arranging the panel here on the program today. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, uh, which has provided very generously uh, support, the financial support for this conference. Um, we value the support of, uh, of their efforts to extend uh, the benefits of libraries uh, to populations across the country. Uh, and then briefly, I'd like to share a little bit about the origins of this, uh, this panel today. So the Aspen Institute has been working with individual library partners in California across the country to engage their communities in re-envisioning the role of the library in the community, and specifically to understand how to leverage the library's assets and the core assets we look at are people, place, and platform assets uh, to address important issues and priorities that are faced by communities. And these dialogues have included stakeholders from the public sector, the private sector, uh, including uh, government, nonprofit, civic, and, and philanthropy organizations. From our first California dialogue in Sutter County in 2016 through the three dialogues we held in 2018, we heard a common request from our library partners when we asked them what issues were at the top of their agenda to discuss with their communities. And we, what we heard was that they wanted to explore how to leverage these new scenic connections that the library was bringing to the community. Public libraries seem to be the new kids on the block when it comes to scenic. Uh, they were saying, you know, now that we have it, what can we do with it that brings innovation and new opportunities and experiences to our community? So I know our inquiry was, was really designed around understanding how scenic can be a game changer when it comes to library services in the community and what it will take to accelerate the spread of these opportunities across the state. Um, I think the underlying premise of, the, of our agenda is illustrated by that exponential curve of change that John Delaney talked about yesterday. You know, the traditional institutional architectures aren't really designed for the pace of change and complexity that John described. And so it requires a design of new architectures for learning and for civic participation. And public libraries are really critical um, nodes on these networks and these new architectures. So we will explore that today. Um, and I will, without further ado, turn this over to John Horgan. 
to get us started. Oh. Thank you very much, Amy. Thanks, everyone, for taking some time to be here. I'm going to show some slides this morning about <clears throat> some of the work um, that Amy has described uh, in, in terms of looking at public libraries in California and what scenic means to them. Um, as I get into this, um, I want to talk a little bit to, to set the stage about what public libraries are all about. Um, public libraries are unique public institutions. They're open to all, they're free to everybody who wants to take advantage of them, and they're resources for learning and advancement. And that makes public libraries extremely critical community anchor institutions. They also have this sense about them of everyday reliability, which is both a virtue, but sometimes can um, create some issues for public libraries in that uh, their everyday reliability sometimes means they're not necessarily top of mind for policymakers and other stakeholders in terms of thinking about how public libraries can address um, the growing range of community issues that the public actually expects libraries to be a part of addressing. And we'll get to that um, expectations issue as the talk goes on. Um, bandwidth needs for public libraries are evolving. The Shelby Coalition, which is a uh, group called the Schools, Homes, Libraries, Broadband Coalition, um, advocates nationally for connectivity to uh, anchor institutions, says that speeds for public libraries should be at least 100 megabits per second. Um, in fact, in a lot of public libraries uh, around the country, speeds fall far short. But with Scenic, um, California public libraries have experienced experience a real boost in bandwidth from an average of 76 meg megabits per second to, cue from my typo, two gigabits per second since public libraries have had access to scenic, um, the scenic network since 2013. So California public libraries have entered into this era of bandwidth abundance as they've started to connect to scenic. And the question we wanted to look at was how are libraries adapting to that change. What are they doing with this new bandwidth abundance? What are some of the challenges or frictions they may encounter? So how do we go about doing this? Um, Amy called me and said, would you like to write uh, some uh, white papers and do some work looking into public libraries in California? I said, yes. Um, and um, as Amy has said, uh, the dialogue on uh, public libraries convened um, the conferences that she described. Um, my job was to interview libraries, uh, librarians, and other stakeholders for the white papers. Um, and that was a real treat for me. Uh, in the prior session, Sonny McPeak mentioned some of my work on looking at how people um, use broadband internet technology and what the frictions are they encounter in terms of adoption. And that work was informed for me by doing uh, large scale surveys of people without broadband and exploring why. So that means you have a survey firm, call up people on the phone, you hope they respond and they um, take 20 minutes in a survey and you get the data back and you go to work. Um, this was a real treat because I wasn't doing a survey, I was actually talking to people myself. Um, and it was a real uh, privilege to be able to interview um, librarians about what the scenic bandwidth meant to them. Um, and the key takeaway was that libraries with this new uh, bandwidth that scenic affords them can provide new services, and I'll talk about that, and also be a fulcrum for community change. On the one hand, both of those key takeaways sound a little bit obvious. Well, you have more bandwidth, you can do more services, terrific. Um, there's some frictions which I'll talk about that some libraries encounter in getting to the new services part. And in terms of being a fulcrum for community change, um, that's sort of a bigger lift. And I'll talk some about uh, some of the challenges involved in helping libraries to get to that sort of bigger lift way of, of thinking. But it has to do um, with um, an expectations gap that I'll talk about. Before I get to that, though, I want to 
talk about the data-based foundation for libraries really having the opportunity to use uh, new bandwidth in new ways to better deliver services to their communities. And that's the foundation of trust that libraries have. I worked at the Pew Research Center for a number of years, and I did a lot of the work that the center did on public attitudes toward public libraries and the things people did um, when they went to public libraries. So we did surveys exploring those issues. We found that four out of five adult Americans thought that libraries were a trusted place to learn about new technologies. About the same number, four out of five, said that libraries and librarians are a trusted source of information. And three, three quarters of Americans said that um, libraries should help people determine what information they can trust. I want to linger for a second on that middle data bar, the 78% number, because when we did that survey, we asked people um, from a list of different kinds of information sor sources, how much do you trust the following list of information sources as a trusted source for information? And that 78% figure for public libraries represents the number one ranking when looking across eight different sources we asked about. So when people are asked to rate how trustworthy information was from the local media, the national media, healthcare institutions, financial institutions, family and friends, libraries topped the list. So libraries are highly trusted institutions, particularly when it comes to technology. And when you think about it, if you're a person with a problem with technology, the device doesn't work, or you just don't know how to carry out a certain task, what institution could you turn to to, have a question, to ask a question about technology that would not have a vested interest in the answer they were to give you? And libraries, to me, comes to the top of mind as that one institution, when answering a question about technology and its trustworthiness, that the person giving you the answer would, wouldn't have a vested interest uh, behind that answer. So libraries are highly trusted, which does enable them to embark down the path of new services, particularly when they have new opportunities to do so with lots more bandwidth. So what did we find in terms of the kinds of services that libraries offer once they have access to the scenic network? Um, and you're going to hear more about that um, from my colleagues on the panel. But virtual reality, gaming, learning, um, came to mind very prominently. Um, gaming, I'll just give one interlude on an, on an example um, and how gaming in rural libraries is particularly interesting and important for those involved with it. So in rural locations, oftentimes uh, people either can't get the internet at home at all or often have service at speeds that really won't support some of the um, gaming applications that are very popular today. So in one rural library that I talked to, um, they started to um, do new gaming services when they got scenic bandwidth, and they found a surprising influx of people to the library um, to um, do the gaming applications, often uh, teenagers, often teenagers that before coming to the library to, for the, these gaming programs didn't know each other before, they would come with their parents who would um, both use other kinds of library uh, resources when, when, we were when they were there, but also these were parents that didn't otherwise know each other. So gaming, with the bandwidth being the catalyst, um, it turned out to be a community engagement function that was sort of an add-on benefit to the new bandwidth, new gaming gear, new gaming program. People liked it, loved it, engaged with it, but it also brought the community together in a new way, in part because um, th there were sort of bandwidth deserts for home access in, in those communities. So scenic in, uh, the scenic network for public libraries in that instance really catalyzed community. We'll hear more, I think, from, from Sarah on uh, virtual reality and how um, that can have some similar impacts but also require libraries to think uh, very deliberately about partnerships to make the whole package work in terms of bringing the bandwidth together with um, the partners you need to have the gear to make virtual reality work. Um, all this said, 
we identified uh, what I call the bandwidth imagination gap in certain circumstances for libraries. There was one library I talked to, um, and the library director said that prior to Scenic, their bandwidth into their library was like 10 megabits per second. Um, that was the advertised speed for um, the connection coming into the library building at the main branch. Um, he said, in fact, when they measured the speed, more often than not, it was well short of 10 megabits per second. Um, so for staff had to do carry out a, a lot of um, staff library functions working at home where they had um, better bandwidth maybe than that 10 megabits uh, per second. When Scenic came to town, um, this was extremely eye-opening for this particular public library. Now library staff could um, do their jobs, check out books, while at the same time, people who came to the library to use the internet or use Wi-Fi um, could also um, carry out those tasks. Before, with just 10 megabits or less, not everybody could do stuff at the same time. So boom, scenic um, connection is there, and um, people are able to use uh, that bandwidth um, for administrative purposes and basic access functions at the public library, and that was terrific. Um, that kind of benefit from the additional bandwidth um, and the sort of joy that that brought to everybody um, involved sometimes inhibited um, the library from th taking that next step to really um, think about new kinds of uh, methods for delivering services or new kinds of services altogether. So that is what we mean by the bandwidth imagination gap, um, namely that the scenic connection can be great, it can have tremendous internal and administrative benefits when that happens, sometimes um, libraries don't think to that next step to um, think beyond um, just the administrative efficiencies to new kinds of service provision. Um, in our conference in Sacramento uh, last December in particular, um, there was a real interest in trying to think of ways that the kind of gathering we were having in Sacramento could help libraries think beyond that bandwidth um, imagination gap. And the notion was to encourage libraries to tackle cross-cutting challenges that are extremely important to communities. So have libraries have a role in universal pre-K? Have libraries have a role in youth programs that might inspire uh, writing skills and creative skills for youth? have libraries involved in, in civic engagement in that libraries could um, play a role in educating people about um, the need to participate in the 2020 census and to help them understand that it will be taken online and the library can serve as, as a resource for that. For pre-K, um, the notion was that um, if universal pre-K is a policy goal, that's going to require far more um, uh, train staff people to provide those pre-K services, libraries could have a role in um, helping people get certification online to show that they're qualified and able to work in a pre-K environment. Um, a challenge to all this, though, was resetting community expectations. I mentioned toward the top that the everyday reliability of libraries sometimes means that they're not necessarily top of mind for some stakeholders for certain kinds of library programs. And there are a couple of data points from um, work I've done at the Pew Research Center, in addition to some work that um, Aspen did in conjunction with the Intersat International City County Management Association a couple of years ago, which was a survey of local government officials. And the next two slides point to how public expectations about the kinds of services libraries should provide can outstrip the expectations that local government officials have. So in work I did at the Pew Research Center, we asked the people whether libraries should have programs to provide uh, training on how to let people understand how to negotiate online privacy and security of their personal data. And three quarters of Americans said, yes, libraries should help us in that regard and they should have programs that uh, speak to those issues and those kinds of digital skills. As you can see, that's <clears throat> nearly a 30 percentage point gap uh, relative to how local government officials answered the same questions about whether libraries should definitely offer programs on online privacy and security. 
So in this context, the public is way out in front of local government officials on a library program related to uh, digital technology, namely online privacy and security. Shows up in other ways as well. Um, nearly half, or just more than half rather, of Americans said that libraries should have programs to support um, entrepreneurs. So this is the second of two examples of where public expectations about library services that are sort of outside the traditional box of um, lending books and doing literacy programs uh, where the public is way ahead of government officials because just 22% of local government officials said that libraries should definitely provide information on how to start a business. So that's an example of how there is an expectations issue to be addressed for public libraries in terms of having public libraries be thought of as a community anchor institution that can serve a wide range of community needs with bandwidth as a tool in uh, meeting those needs. So moving forward, um, a theme that we surfaced in our December meeting was that libraries should position themselves, again, to take on some big problems, um, promote equity in their communities, be a showcase for uh, technology in their community. There's a Pew Research Center data point floating around about how more than half of all Americans think, think libraries should have new technologies like 3D printers or um, virtual reality um, there for demonstration for people. And libraries should be participants in community design, meaning their services should be thought of as something that, yes, happen within the walls of the library, but because exciting things are going on inside the walls of a library, libraries should be part of uh, being an amenity that might reshape how people see um, a neighborhood as a place to settle and um, uh, engage with their community in that way. Um, to do this, um, we talked about the need to do more outreach for libraries. That means measure impact and communicate results to uh, policymakers and politicians. Um, and communicating results to policymakers could be as, as easy as um, noting to elected officials that the library can be a free space for you to have a town hall meeting. The real sense from our discussions was, was that libraries need to do more of that. Another theme was um, the, the various things that we discovered in terms of libraries using scenic bandwidth to provide new services doesn't just happen by accident. Libraries have to engage in strategic planning to figure out how to get from point A, which is getting more bandwidth into the building, to point B, which is using that bandwidth for nifty new services that serve the community. So that's sort of an outward looking theme that we took away from the discussion. At the same time, uh, the one thing I want to leave with you is a little bit paradoxical in that we found that libraries also have to think inside the network. And that means think inside the scenic network. Public libraries are now part of, as this crowd knows better than I do, a research and education network that has an enormous amount of digital content available. Libraries have to understand that they now have a network that accesses that digital content from the research and education institutions around the state, and that can be brought in to libraries to help them provide new services with scenic bandwidth. So I, I will uh, stop there, and we will move on to discussion. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our panel. I just realized I probably should have introduced John before he started speaking, but I assumed everybody knows John because everybody I know knows John. So, um, so John Horgan is the senior fellow at the Technology Policy Institute located in, in Washington, D.C., and, and as you can tell, his work focuses on technology adoption and digital inclusion. Uh, and he's also currently a senior advisor to the Urban <clears throat> Libraries Council. Uh, he's served as associate director for research at the Pew Research Center, where he focused on libraries and their impact on communities, as well as technology adoption patterns and open government data. And then to John's right is Sarah Jones. Sarah is the director of the County Library Services for Marin County Free Library System. 
Her focus has been in making the library a critical resource for improving student achievement in underserved communities in Marin County. And she's currently collaborating on a project to deploy education and immersive and learning environments with virtual reality, augmented reality, and extended reality in libraries. And she's gonna talk a bit about that. Sarah also wears a second hat um, that is relevant here today. She's president of Khalifa, which is a consortium of more than 230 libraries and the largest library network in California. And Khalifa is the fiscal agent and, and statewide broadband aggregator uh, selected by the California State Library with a significant role in advancing scenic use among public libraries in the state. And then at the end of the other end of the day is there is Jared Keller. Jarrett's Deputy Director of Infrastructure at the Sacramento Public Library uh, with responsibility for collection services, facilities, finance, information technology, communications, and marketing. Uh, prior to joining the Sacramento Public Library, Jared was the Chief Information Officer and Acting Deputy State Librarian uh, of California at the California State Library, and he has been intimately involved uh, with scenic and public libraries from the beginning of this conversation here in California. Uh, so I want to thank them all for, for joining me here. Um, I want to pick up that, that point that John made about the expectations gap uh, and ask Jared to describe a little bit the community you're serving in Sacramento and how uh, having scenic uh, at the library is, is or has changed expectations uh, and what role the library is playing in setting community expectations for broadband. Sure, happy to. So uh, just a little bit about Sacramento Public Library. So we're a joint powers authority. We operate the libraries on behalf of the city and county of Sacramento, the cities of Citrus Heights, Galt, Isleton, Elk Grove, Rancho Cordova. And uh, we cover over a thousand square miles and we have suburban, urban, rural communities. We have 28 locations. In many of our locations, we sometimes are the only service provider in town which is kind of sad in an area of Sacramento, but uh, we have a lot of our rural communities where uh, we are it, and if it wasn't for us, uh, the community would not have access. So um, our communities have a lot of expectations of us on just base services we provide, but since um, connecting to um, uh, CalRIN, um, really our expectations that we have of ourselves and what our communities expect, I think, have really changed. But what I want to do is I want to walk down a little path on kind of how we got where we got. And um, some of you may be in that same situation. So um, when, for us, the primary goal was connect, connect, connect. But once we connected, we sat and we asked ourselves, wow, what are we going to do with all this? I mean, it truly was a shock for us because it's like, well, we connected, but now what's next? So what we had to do is in order to think beyond, we had to look inside. And so the first thing we started to do was what sort of administrative economies of scales can we do with this, this enhanced connectivity? And part of that was we started to do some, some of you may laugh because libraries were a little behind maybe some of the other um, sectors here. But, you know, it was simple things like migrating services to the cloud. We migrated integrated library system. We took advantage of high speed voice services. We migrated old POTS lines. To, uh, we migrated our website. So it was really about seeing what we could do internally and building that. And from that, we started to expand what sort of additional public services we could offer. I mean, one of the biggest things we do is we provide connectivity and having, uh, not having broadband limitations is absolutely phenomenal. But what we were, what we were gonna do with that? Um, I do have to do a call out. I have two people who came to this conference, Alan Worthy, um, he's our IT supervisor at the Sacramento Public Library and Chris Durr, special projects librarian. Uh, these guys are phenomenal in that they've made uh, everything we do possible so I can be up here and talk to you guys. And so they're probably cringy now because that means I'm going to ask them for something a little later on. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but what we did is that we started to look at, okay, what's next? What are some of the big things that we could do? So we had uh, Chris who came up with wonderful ideas. Um, okay, gaming's big, but what if we actually taught people how to create video games? What if we taught them how to do the production? What if we live streamed in real gamers to help them develop the games, programmers? So that was one of the things that we did. In addition, we started broader strokes. Um, so we started leveraging social media platforms like Twitch. It's a gamers 
um, platform, some of you may or may not be familiar with it. So with that, we took gaming aspects and we had um, teens build um, representations of our Sacramento room and other objects in Minecraft. And we real-time broadcast that on Twitch. So it was about kind of violating some of the expectations of what public would think a public library would do. But at the same time, too, it started to ignite the imagination of staff, where staff start seeing this happening. And they're like, wow, this is something really interesting that we could start doing. And it could expand services that we would normally offer. And um, it's kind of created this momentum where we started these pilots with these projects. And now the demand is a lot of other locations. I mean, everybody would love to do it, but there's only so much time and resources. So really what this, you know, um, unlimited bandwidth has done is it's really kind of, I would say, kind of thrown out the rule book of traditional services that libraries um, offer. And it's made us think bigger and like there's, you know, the possibilities are endless. And we're starting to see that from our communities that not only they expect us to be the fastest game in town, but to offer some really dynamic bleeding edge resources. And so that's kind of um, our experience right now. And Sarah, I'm sure you have something similar to that as too. Yeah, so Sarah, I wanted to ask you to, to share with us a little bit about the community that you're serving and uh, you really taking a leadership role in uh, looking at how virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality uh, can go deep, deeper into libraries, um, not just to, to test it out, but to really transform programs and services. All right, um, morning. Uh, the Marin County Free Library, uh, Marin County, I'm sure most everyone in the room knows, is just north of San Francisco. And it's often really um, perceived as uh, very wealthy and the education is um, really incredible. And those are both true. But what is also true is that um, just last year we were noted in race counts as the most inequitable county in California. So on one side we have, we have a couple people caught in the admissions um, controversy who are buying their kids ways into uh, um, uh, you know into these uh, top-notch universities but the, the opposite side of that is that we have a number of schools and, and school districts that are have true struggles um, in fact we have one school district the Sausalito Marin City School District who the um, California AG has indicated the uh, Marin City School is segregated and um, they're in the process of, of uh, defending the way that they're sorting resources and in that school only one in four kids um, reads at grade level and that is actually a consistent and persistent um, fact all the way until they get to eighth grade o only about half of them go to high school so we have this you know on the one side um, a lot of private schools and a lot of really great public schools and then on the other side we have some kids um, and students and teachers that really don't have the resources and are really um, not providing opportunity in any kind of equal way at all so I think that sets a basis for some of the work that we're trying to do um, and the way that it came about for us is that we have a partner that was in the formerly in the tech industry and he helped us with a maker space and a digital media lab and he said to me a number of years ago you know this virtual reality thing is really getting big and we should we should try to figure out a way to jump in and I said well that sounds pretty interesting but you know I I'm not been a close watcher but I've seen over the past you know at least 10 20 years that it would get kind of exciting and then it would taper back and it never really um, it, it never really served what we, we thought the promise was, but uh, uh, there was much more promise. So we said, well, let's give it a try. And so, and again, uh, in the inequity um, issues, we wanted to make sure that we were trying in communities that would have the least likelihood of seeing this really advanced technology. So in partnership with another library in Marin, the San Rafael Library, we put it in our three most underserved communities. And really, we didn't know much about what we were doing, um, but we, we, we thought it was really interesting and we thought that people would um, be interested. And I think it goes back to what's said here is there's not really high expectations in general for public libraries, which I think, I mean, in some cases there are that we're the most trusted and that we're, we're perceived a lot, but as being real leaders in cutting edge and bleeding edge technology, not so much. People are not really seeing um, libraries 
in that venue. So I think part of this message is to change that, is to really bring out things that people are going, well, is my public library doing that? That's pretty exciting. So that, I think that was one of the things that, that in my first uh, thinking about this, I thought, well, that's, that's really great because that will, you know, you get media buzz and all kinds of good things happen. But then as we dove deeper, we saw that this technology has tremendous opportunity for um, helping learners at different levels. And, and then the other part is because we're so early in, we are able to help guide the content. So it is, a um, you know, for the most part, it's a gaming platform. And so most of the content is really pushing towards gaming. But there is a lot of people understanding that there's workforce development, there's learning opportunities, there's all kinds of things that will, will actually be better in the immersive environment. So back to my partner who uh, was able to, to uh, actually get us gear. Um, we uh, got the state librarian, Greg Lucas, who needs some big shout outs for this. So he gave, he granted $35,000 through Khalifa and we tested it for about six or seven months. And it was pretty successful. I mean, uh, we actually tested it before we had seen it connections. It was a little less successful there because the connectivity does really matter. But um, I think what Greg was really intent on is that this is a technology that is interesting and new, and it would really bring um, two folks saying, well, what is Scenic doing for public libraries? Well, it's doing these great things like Jared said and that we're doing is it's, it's changing up what you're thinking and it's service delivery that maybe um, would absolutely not be possible for, for the general public. So uh, that, was a, uh, the, that test went quite well. Um, there's a lot of things to figure out. There's legal agreements, there's hygiene, there's uh, what, what content, how does that content fit in a program. So those are all things that we started figuring out. And then um, the State Library again supported us uh, rolling that that uh, project to 100 libraries in California. So 100 libraries in California got both a Oculus and an HTC Vive, and there was a, a, a state money and library services and technology act money involved with that. But those, those corporate partners also provided, um, they really provided us a lot of things. Uh, one thing that you probably, everyone in this room knows is you really need a great computer to run it, especially in those early days. You had to have a really high-end gaming computer. So the companies helped us with making sure that you would not only get the, you know, the headset devices, but that you would get computers. And I think the important part of that is the collaboration with um, the fact that it was important to the library to do this, but it was also important to these um, to these corporations, Oculus and HTC Vive, because they were having adoption issues. They really saw that in order for this to fly, it had to get widely adopted, and it was slow. Um, you might have, if you paid any attention to this, you might have saw they tried to roll it out in Best Buy, and that wasn't super successful. And they're still trying to do that push. But at the end of the day, um, what we were able to do is to have a partnership relationship with them that um, benefits both of us. And then as it's evolved, what's been great is they also are really interested in the learning environment that, um, that VR and augmented reality and extended reality do. And so they're, uh, they're getting very interested in finding content providers that help in both learning and, as I mentioned, in workforce training. So those, um, I think, are things that really uh, help uh, change the dynamic of what people believe about libraries, and then also serves the, the purpose of why do you get high-speed access? Why is that important? Well, it's important because you have this trusted institution that can show new things, and, um, and you know, I can see why people didn't want to go do it at Best Buy, because they figured that they were going to have, you know, soon that... The, the intention was that Best Buy was going to sell it to them. But in our space, we're not trying to sell them anything. We're not trying to, uh, much like we deployed public computers a couple of decades ago, we just wanted to provide that access for people to be able to use it and to understand it. So our next steps have been over the last um, uh, year or so is we're starting, uh, we actually partnered with um, the state of Washington, who has also done some really interesting work, and the state of Nevada, who has also used um, the partner who's, there's a, uh, he has a, a, a nonprofit called XR Libraries, and it basically it's built a community of practice, so everybody doing VR work can get together and share that so that they can um, help one another with the issues that, that they do. Uh, that, or that they um, find as they're doing the projects. So 
the, um, uh, what we're trying to do is we know that this is actually happening in a lot of other places in the country too, but it's tending to happen with, um, you know, in, in spaces that are kind of contained. And so our purpose and, and our hope in the next year is to actually have a, a forum about this, about uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and extended learning. And, and at the end of the day, I'm calling it immersive learning because I think that is what the focus really should be. So we're hoping to do that um, in late, late fall or winter this year or early spring. And I think I, I would just like to, uh, um, you know, and, and kind of a final comment, make a, uh, many of these things happen for us because of state libraries and state library leadership and the, the folks at our state level understanding that um, high speed access happens and or it should happen and will make a big difference in the equity gaps. But the other, the other part that's really important about this is we do have a federal agency, the Institute of Museums and Library Services, who is um, proposed to be zeroed out by our current president. So, uh, and that's happened many year, over many years, but we need to keep pushing back and saying, you know, public libraries, all libraries, academic libraries, school libraries are critically important, and that federal money leverages all these things that, that we have been talking about. So, um, you know, call your legislators, <laughs> make sure that money doesn't, uh, doesn't in fact get eliminated. But um, I think in just in a final analysis, the, the number one things that I'd like to mention is that libraries are great collaborators. And I think that we're often have to bring ourselves to the table to find that collaboration space. But we would invite everyone to ask us to that table because we really do. Uh, uh, we bring some great skill sets and we bring the ability to uh, collaborate, I think, almost you know, uh, really quite uniquely because it's in our it's in our DNA to do it. We've been sharers since day one. So if uh, I think if we could get better partnerships with um, everyone in the scenic network, I think we could all uh, do a whole lot more with it. So is that? Uh, so I wanted to I wanted to do a little pivot from your libraries, which are clearly you know, leading and, and seizing the opportunities there. And, and it looks like you've done a really great job of closing that broadband imagination gap with, you know, with good leaders, good partnerships. Um, what's it going to take to close that broadband imagination gap across California libraries? Um, there's, you know, I, I like to think of libraries as there are three different groups. There are the uh, early adopters and those who are fearlessly moving on uh, to uh, with great leadership, often very good resources, but sometimes just the ingenuity to find good resources, and they're forging ahead. Um, there's a group at the end which struggle with so many different issues um, that, you know, it, it, it's they have to just get up to speed on basic library services. And then there's a very large middle that mm -hmm. has the insight and the desire to do something more and to be more transformative, not just taking incremental step, steps. Um, how do you, you know, how do we move those libraries into this much more, you know, this bigger thinking, the imaginative space and reaching out to develop the kinds of strategic partnerships that you're involved in? So um, I think the issues are, there's actually quite a few issues. I mean, one, I'm just going to say it, you know, one is always the funding model, right? Um, you know, public libraries, statewide, we don't get much money. It's a local funding level. We know all how we struggle, how, Sarah, you know, how we make the most with absolutely nothing, yeah. you know, um, continuously. And that is a real huge struggle for a lot of libraries in California. Um, and so it's about being creative and leveraging partnerships, um, which is really big. The other challenge that we have, too, is um, most of our public libraries, uh, the IT is provided by the city or the county. There are actually very few of us that have our own IT shops. So for those who don't have their IT shops, it puts a lot of responsibility on staff in introducing this commodity hardware software into these enterprise environments, and then also some of the challenges they have So um, with the local city or county IT. So that's definitely some obstacles. Um, but there is a lot of positive that's, that, that can definitely come out of this by leveraging the partnership, being able to provide vision for that city and county IT to help them buy on to buy, to buy in. I mean, uh, two years ago, I would have never imagined that we would be running a lot of this um, commodity stuff on our enterprise networks and doing some of the programs we're doing. And it's really uh, getting past that. And it's also willing to be able to fail at trying something. 
you know, um, sometimes we have a motto, it's called fail fast, but learn from it. And um, so there's also that too. So it's about really, um, you know, a lot of different elements out there, but it's definitely about, you know, um, trying some of these new things. Um, you're going to have to really work and leverage your partnerships. And also a lot of us, bigger libraries, we do stuff well, and let's not always reinvent the wheel. So if we've done it, that can help you ramp up a whole lot faster. And I think I would just add that um, a great way to do it is to have some small successes. So, and I think a, a huge part, and I think Jared talked about this, is you probably, in, in any size library has some people that probably um, have some, some um, deep passion for some technology things. And if you would just try to find out what that is and then let them um, take those projects forward. And, and again, it's really important that failure um, is an, an, a, a really, uh, and you know, it, I think that's been a great thing about the maker movement because you don't make without failure. So I think that that's been a mind shift for all of us to say that, you know, let's just try something. And if it doesn't work, then we're gonna try again. And then I would actually argue, I've run three public library systems, two with 10 branches and one that was a, a standalone with some you know small things outside. It's much harder in the multi-branch system. And I would just yeah. say from those of you that, uh, and not, we're not a big system, we're not LA County or, uh, I, I think one of the lessons learned about that is that you might just do things in some places and not do them in others and that's perfectly fine. Because I think, uh, you know, and I, we found that with 3D printing and we also found it with virtual reality. To buy 10 systems and to figure out all the logistics of, you know, because we like, librarians like our logistics and our organizations and our planning. But at some point you just have to let that go and say, okay, here's a library that really needs this because their community really wants it. So just let them do it. And if the other nine or the other 20 or the other whatever don't do it, that's okay too. But they, they'll probably watch it and if they see that small success, they'll want to say, well, how do I get get in on some of that. And I wanted to bring up the point that John made about the opportunities um, for thinking inside the network and to think about how uh, public libraries can leverage relationships and expertise with the types of uh, other members of Scenic and the types of organizations that are represented here in the room. Um, so, you know, when you think about uh, public libraries and the potential for, for partnerships or really extending that work. Maybe it's, you know, the, the really exciting opportunities in citizen science. I, you know, again, I recite, I'll uh, cite John Delaney's presentation yesterday, but uh, those opportunities to think about that sensor data and the engagement that uh, people in communities, whether it's uh, kids uh, through some of the enrichment activities or it's adults or um, it's local governments that are interested in connecting in. You know, the library as a scenic provider has um, a really potentially you know, very powerful role. Uh, so how do you think about uh, developing these relationships and developing this thinking inside the network? And, and Jared, maybe you can uh, also speak to the differences in the audiences that are served, which might give us a complimentary look at the types of institutions in Scenic? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think one of the unique things that, you know, libraries have is um, our user base is 39 million Californians. So anybody in California can come and get a public library card from anywhere. That's a very different model than what a lot of other senior, Scenic members have. I mean, you kind of have defined populations. Our populations are pretty undefined, and so, um, you know, I like to say we, we, we reach and touch everyone um, in, in uh, California, especially with the services that we offer. Um, but going back to what you were saying, what was really critical was everybody, this conference is actually pretty lightning because I know last night we were talking and looking at partnerships with, within the network on doing some 3D modeling and some other things where we can start leveraging what some of the other universities are doing here at the Sacramento Public Library. So it's really about you know, this is a venue that brings us all together, and this is about us. It's it's really about discovery and what different services we offer and how we can start leveraging stuff from within the network and how we can also start contributing to it. So um, that was kind of what I was looking for. And I would just add one thing. I've been in California for just about six years, and um, this is the scenic, scenic is spectacular. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look across um, what other states are struggling with and the idea that there's broadband connectivity for the whole lifespan of a learner. 
So now that public libraries and school libraries and universities are in, then from from birth really until um, at the you know end of life, there is a a backbone to make sure that we're ready for the 21st century, especially the digital learning part, which I think we should never you know don't at all take uh, for granted because I, uh, there to my knowledge, I mean. It, small states couldn't do this. So the fact that the, the California with 39 million people figured this out is just a, a wonderful foundation. And then I think the, the building blocks are then is that if we're all in this together, how do we work together better to, you know, because really we all want the same thing. We want uh, great communities and we want every everyone to have opportunity and we want them to be able to do what you know, we're always told that the jobs that, that, that children will do now, we haven't even invented. So we have to get you know, really flexible and smart about what that's going to look like. One thing, one thing that came across in talking to librarians in the for the white paper was the need for additional information sharing mechanisms to help libraries kind of reach that middle third or middle tier that you were identifying, Amy, to help them understand what the opportunities are with Scenic and what steps they should take. Um, there was a real sense that libraries should try to be a little more risk prone in thinking about how to use Scenic, but at the same time, you want to give people sort of a roadmap on how to take risks. So if the Marin Public Library has figured out the ins and outs of making the virtual reality program work, and you're in a library who's just contemplating that, it might feel like a big risk to you to go down that path. But to take that risk, it'll be helpful to have an information sharing mechanism to know that oh, I can call up uh, the Marin Public Library and figure out how to do this so that um, I have a roadmap so that my risk isn't just flying blind. And that kind of information sharing is important. A lot of people said that the Scenic Conference serves that function, but there was, uh, in my sense, a, a thirst for more such mechanisms. So um, I do want to open it up if there are any questions from uh, the audience. We have uh, quite a few. We'll go with John first, and, and we just have a few minutes, so hopefully um, there'll be quick answers, or we can quick. stick around after the break, and or uh, during the break, and follow up. One thing that would be really interesting to work with you folks on, uh, to uh, flirting with the boundary between success and failure, the, taking risks, John, uh, would be to begin to meld something that would be equivalent to Sim Ocean that deals with real-time data flow played across against some sort of gaming setup. I don't know how to do that myself, but it seems to me that having people begin to identify with real changes in the real ocean and think about what they might do to address those real changes would be a way of engaging not just preteens and teens, but some of us really old people. Next question over here, James. Let me go around. Oh, student beat me. Yes, up. this is James Neal from the IMLS. Um, one of the areas that I'm seeing a lot of interest in, and I'm a former children's librarian, and I saw this in reality as well, I'd like to know how Scenic in the state of California <clears throat> is addressing what is known as the homework gap. Students who do not have, and families who do not have, access to the internet at home, yet who are required to do homework that is being assigned by school districts that requires a connection? Well, um, we have actually deployed hotspots, and I was really interested in the presentation that you were in, um, because we, we tried the same thing that I believe uh, that Maine did, is we, we tried to give hotspots to students um, based on recommendations from teachers. And that hasn't been as successful as we'd like it to be. So, and then I think the other part too is just, uh, we're not great at leveraging the other opportunities. I know that there's good opportunities in, in housing for them to have access to, um, um, you know, internet uh, in their in their own homes, but they often don't know how to figure that out. So I think that what we need to do is get a lot better about collaborating with the partners where um, uh, where where those students are that need need the most help. But honestly, we should just get a lot more um, 
uh, hot spots and uh, computers to go home with them so they could do that and then make really good connections so that the libraries that are close enough that we are open and can help with that. I'm sure you are working on it too. Yeah, I mean, we're working on a similar problem, a similar issue where we're going to be pushing out hotspots. And also, we've modified our hours to increase our hours. And But like going back to, once again, in many of our rural locations, we are the only game in town. And in those, we've made sure that we have, you know, literally as many computers as we can put into a building. Uh, with what square footage constraints that we have and um, you know and we're there when the schools aren't I mean you know we're open when they're closed we're there we help help kids any ways that we can and there's one more question here yeah I, I think this is for John so in one of your graphs um, it showed that there was some difference between the expectation of services that the public thinks the library should provide and the expectation that government officials think they should provide, and how do you align those? Because obviously if the government um, thinks you should pro be providing totally different services or, or there's no alignment there, then that can sort of get in the way of providing what it is you actually want to provide. Yeah, I, I think in closing that gap, that's an education mission for public libraries, and we hope that some of the data um, that the Pew Research Center and others have put out can help with that argument to say that with changes in technology, public expectations about libraries are only growing. So they do expect books. Um, they expect books they can pick up. They don't just expect eBooks, but they expect a host of other services. Um, and the data show that uh, the expectations are high. It shows in a couple instances that public officials um, are, are lagging that. And, and so it becomes incumbent upon libraries to make that case. And one thing from the discussions we held, um, particularly last December in, in Sacramento, is that by putting libraries at the center of big public issues, whether it's pre-K or the 2020 census, um, doing that through action is the best way for public libraries to embark on that public education task to help those gaps be closed. I would also add it's really important that we stick with the anchor institution mm -hmm. because that really helps when they're, when um, we're seen as important as hospitals and and uh, and schools and um, so in in policy wherever we're included as an anchor institution I think that that will really help us. We're seeing with the community engagements we do at the Aspen Institute that education process that John mentioned um, is really starting to take root when uh, when libraries engage, reach out and engage with their stakeholders, particularly in government. Uh, and that ICMA study, the last time an ICMA had study had been done on public libraries was in, um, it was about 10 years earlier, I think. And, uh, um, and there was a significant increase in looking at the importance of broadband and computer access. I mean, clearly it makes sense. Uh, so I think it's some of it's a process about understanding the role of the library, and some of it I think is just a process of understanding those issues that libraries are really central to in their mission and how important those issues are becoming in communities where workforce development, entrepreneurship, technology access is, is becoming more vital than, um, than it's been seen in the past. So I'm going to wrap up here um, uh, with a conclusion. I think that uh, you know one of the things that I love about public libraries is how uh, imaginative they are and how much opportunity there is in working with them in communities. Um, our Beyond Connectivity conference and, and the report that's coming out is really a framework for just getting started to understand this new role of libraries uh, in as a member of Scenic and also the ability to leverage Scenic connections to really transform libraries and communities. So developing blueprints for action will take some more time and engagement from across Scenic membership. And that's one of the things that our group is looking into. Uh, I'd like to invite anybody who's interested in continuing this conversation uh, from 11.15 to 12.15, uh, a group of us will be meeting in the Dracana conference room, which is over in the Learning Center um, to talk a little bit more about uh, how we can de develop these forums for information sharing and exchange and really develop these blueprints to accelerate uh, the uptake and innovation with CNEC. So I thank you all for being here and wish you a good rest of the conference.